Hey everyone, and welcome back. Are you ready to dive into something, well, pretty major? Sounds exciting. It is. We're tackling organ transplants today, and let me tell you, the amount of info you all sent in, wow. So we're going deep, unearthing the most fascinating bits about organ transplants, who gets them, how they work, the whole deal. You know, most folks, when they hear organ transplants, they think heart, maybe kidneys. Right. right. Makes sense. But it's way more diverse than that. We're talking livers, lungs. No way. Intestines, too. Yep. Intestines. Yeah. Even pancreases. And get this, sometimes it's not just one, it's multiple organs at once. Whoa, hold on. Multiple organs? Like, at the same time, that's got to be incredibly complicated. What's involved in, say, a heart and lung transplant? It is mind-blowingly complex. Mm -hmm. And it highlights something crucial. Organ transplants, they're not as simple as, sign me up. You know, not like ordering a pizza. Uh. There's this whole evaluation to see who's a good candidate, and it's not a guarantee. So let's break that down. What makes someone a good candidate for a transplant? Tons of factors. Age is huge. Mm. Overall health, obviously. They're checking your weight, any infections lurking, other conditions. They want the full picture. So it's not just, I need a new organ. It's, am I healthy enough to get one and actually thrive afterwards? Exactly. They want to make sure a transplant is the best move and that you're strong enough for the surgery, the recovery, the whole nine yards. Sounds like just getting on the list is a journey in itself. What does that even look like? Oh, it is. Picture it like... <laughs> A series of steps you got to take. Okay, walk us through it. Step one. Referral from your doctor. They'll figure out if a transplant's even on the table. You know. All right, so referral, check. What's next? You contact a transplant center. And listen, you're not limited to just one. Shop around, see which one feels right for you. Makes sense. This is huge. You want to feel good about where you're getting care. So referral, center. What's step three? The deep dive. Evaluations, and I mean serious ones. Yeah. Blood work galore, blood type organ function, the whole shebang, yeah. imaging scans too, ultrasound, CTs, MRIs, maybe even biopsies. Wow, they are leaving no stone unturned. Nope. And it's not just physical. They're looking at your lifestyle, diet, exercise, all that. Yeah. And this is big. Are you mentally, emotionally ready for this? Right, because this whole thing, the waiting, the uncertainty, that's got to be so stressful. Absolutely. That waiting game, that's a huge GE part of the transplant journey, and it can be rough. That's why mental health support through all this is so important. It's true. You're right. We do focus a lot on the medical side of things. But like you said, that mental and emotional aspect, that's huge. It is. And it often gets overlooked. Huh. Think about it. The waiting, the not knowing, the what ifs, all of that. Yeah. It's a lot to handle. That's why, thankfully, a lot of transplant centers now, they have these amazing support systems in place. Support groups, therapists, social workers, you name it. It's like you need support for the support system. But, yeah. okay, let's say you've aced the evaluation mentally, physically, the whole package. Yeah. You're officially on the list. Now what? The waiting game begins. We wait for that perfect match. Okay, but how does that work? Is there some massive organ database somewhere? Like they're searching for your name? Uh-huh. I like that visual. It's not quite a database where we're like, beep, boop, beep, yeah. blood type match. It's way more intricate. Remember we were talking about your immune system before, how it's like your own personal bodyguard, keeping things in check. Right. Always on the lookout for anything suspicious. Exactly. So with a transplant, we got to make sure that new organ isn't going to set off those alarms. Right. That's where compatibility testing comes in. Which is why you can't just swap organs between anyone, even if their blood type matches. We because... got it. Blood type is just one piece of a very complex puzzle. Yeah. There's also something called HLA typing. Big word, I know. But it's basically looking at these specific genes that control how your immune system is like, hey, that's me, versus, whoa, intruder alert. So it's like a genetic fingerprint for your immune system. Exactly. We're looking for a donor with a similar enough fingerprint so your body's less likely to reject the new organ. That's wild. Talk about high-tech matchmaking. So they're considering all of that blood type, this HLA thing, your time on the list. You got it. It's this whole complex algorithm crunching all those factors to find the best match for each person. And of course, there's the urgency factor too. Hmm. Some people need that transplant sooner rather than later. Right, of course. So let's say all the stars align. You've got a match. You've had the surgery. You're recovering. What does life even look like after a transplant? Ah, the million-dollar question. And you know what? That, my friend, is what we're going to dive into next. And we are back. Okay, so life after an organ transplant. We've talked about the before, the during. But what about that after? Paint us a picture. What's different? Well, right off the bat, there's recovery. 
And that, my friend, is no walk in the park. We're talking weeks, sometimes months of healing, figuring out new meds, going to appointments. Mm. It's a process. Meds, right. Those are a given after a transplant. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Remember how we were talking about the immune system? Always on high alert. Well, anti-rejection meds, those are key. They keep your immune system in check so it doesn't attack the new organ. And we're not talking short term here. This is for the long haul, most likely for life. Wow. Okay. So are there side effects then? Because that's a lot of meds. There can be. Yep. Yeah. And it's different for everyone, but some common ones are higher risk of infections, some cancers. It's a balancing act, really. You're trying to manage the immune response, but also keep those side effects in check. It's something you work on with your doctor long term. So it's not just like new organ, problem solved. It's a whole lifestyle shift. What else do people need to be thinking about? Lifestyle. Yeah, that's huge. Healthy diet. Got to move that body. Good sleep. Those become even more important after a transplant. It's like you've been given this amazing gift, this second chance, and you want to make it count, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're taking care of yourself, making choices that support your health for the long run. So we've talked about things that affect how successful a transplant is, age, overall health, those lifestyle choices we just mentioned. But what about the organ itself? Does it matter like how old the donor organ is or what kind of shape it was in? That's a great question, and it's trickier than it seems. For the longest time, everyone thought younger is better, but newer research is challenging that idea. We're seeing that sometimes those older organs, if they've been well taken care of, they can be just as successful. That's incredible. It shows you how much we're still learning and how medicine is always evolving. It really does. We're always pushing the boundaries. Okay, so we've talked a lot about what happens when a transplant goes well, but what about when it doesn't? Like what if someone isn't eligible for a transplant at all? or it's just not an option for them, where does that leave them? That's a really tough situation. Yeah. And it's not easy to talk about. Some folks, it's just not medically possible for them. Maybe their health isn't good enough or there are other complications. And for others, they might be waiting years even, and there's just no guarantee. Mm -hmm. In those cases, it becomes about what else can we do? Right. What can we do to improve quality of life, even if a transplant isn't possible? So it's not giving up hope, but maybe shifting that hope, focusing on something different. Exactly. Maybe there are other treatments that can help manage their condition, even if it's not a cure. And honestly, just as important is that emotional support, those conversations with loved ones, maybe even exploring end of life care. As hard as those conversations are, they're so necessary. It's a good reminder that even though organ donation is amazing, life changing even, it's not always a simple path. There's so much more to it. You said it. It takes a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding to navigate it all. Wow, this deep dive has been, well, a lot to process. We've learned so much about the science, the emotions, everything in between. It's clear, organ donation, it's more than just a surgery, right? It's about hope, second chances, the human spirit at its strongest. It really is. Yeah. And it makes you appreciate the human body, how resilient it is, yeah. and how much we can achieve when we put our minds to it. If there's one thing I hope you all take away from this, it's to have those conversations about organ donation, your wishes, what matters most to you. Those are powerful conversations, life-saving even. So keep learning, keep those conversations going, and we'll see you next time.